Um, so my Elvis, um, I think I need to click on that one and test this. Yeah, it works. So a few facts about me. Um, I've been working in the industry for like 10 years, about 10 years. Um, I think like any of you, I still have no idea what the heck I'm doing. Uh, let me try to gra drag this to get my slides in front of me bigger. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I've been working with Electron, which is a kind of a Chromium framework. Actually, it is a crap Chromium on top of which you can just make web applications and that's like a cross-browser, cross-platform thing. So basically you write the code once and then it runs on Linux and Mac and on Windows. Of course, the promise is that there's a bit harder. Um, I started with C and I was actually working in networking for industrial printers and then somehow life took me to JavaScript. So I really have no idea what the heck happened. <laughs> But um, yeah, I really enjoy it. So because of that, I actually want to do a bit of a combination to talk with you about the internals of the browser and how the memory works. So how the memory is managed, how the heap is organized, what is garbage in terms of uh, memory, and then how a um, garbage collector algorithm works. And then we can look a bit at V8. So um, if I go back to my old days, I used to allocate memory using malloc usually, or calloc. And I would free it at the end, and then I will get, you know, all those bugs, segmentation fault, and all those things. Then in later on, I worked a bit with C++ as well. So you would new things, and then you would delete, or you would write a destructor that will do it itself. And then I went to JavaScript, and then in JavaScript you feel like God because you just create, put the curly braces, and you just created an object, right, out of nothing, no constructor, nothing. It's, it's just amazing. You didn't knew anything. We used to new things in ES5 using construction functions. Later on, we introduced class. I don't know what that is about, but like, yes, we did it. Yeah. And then I was like, hey, but what about delete? Where did that go, right? Well, it turns out it's automatic, actually. So there is something called a garbage collector, which is a part of the runtime system, which actually tries to free up memory when it realizes that there's not enough memory to allocate memory or sometimes at a certain threshold, let's say that the memory consumption is 80%, is gonna try to collect to make space for the new objects. And it's kind of nice that the program itself, it's called a mutator because it mutates memory, right? So they are kind of concurrent, you can think, right? One tries to clear the memory, the other one tries to create more things, right? So there's a bit of a game between the two. Um, the way you can organize the heap, it's quite simple, right? We all did free lists in Computer Science 101. You can just have a free list. First, you have, of course, you have the entire heap and one node. And as you allocate chunks, you can keep track of the free space. And then the occupied space, you know, of course, is going to be in between. But as you, this process goes and goes, actually, you're going to be suffering from fragmentation, right? So the memory is going to get fragmented over time. And then it can get so fragmented that you want to, let's say, allocate uh, one megabyte, but there's no space for one megabyte. You have like actually one megabyte of available memory, but it's just in chunks of one kilobyte, let's say, right? So you cannot actually allocate anything, right? And it be can become very expensive depending on the heap size. So if you're like on a server and then for some reason you have like a four gigabyte heap size and that's very fragmented to find a free space, it can actually take a while. So right, it's an ON where n is the size of the free space list, right? And then the solution is download more RAM, right? We all do it. The server doesn't scale. Yeah, let's just put more RAM there. But actually, the smart people that did garbage collection, they came with some solutions. And then that would be periodically try to compact. So try to move objects around and move them on the on a size of the, like, let's say, to the left of the heap. So you basically have bigger chunks, or in order to avoid this ON, you can actually keep your memory like some ranges in mo multiple lists. So instead of having only one list with all the free space, you can actually have multiple lists. One, let's say, has objects like chunks over one megabyte, one and so on, you know, like so you can just have some certain ranges so you can look up faster where the free space is. But then there's a second way of organizing the heap, which is you just split it in two halves and you start allocating in one half, and then you still allocate in that half, right? Continuously, 
And then let's say that you want to allocate that little guy. What you'll do, you're going to start copying what's alive. We'll get to that in a minute into this half. Then you now have the space. You're going to put your object there. And then you just swap the two things, right? Now this becomes the, the left one, well, more like right for you guys. The right one is now the from space. The other one is the to space, right? This is actually kind of like even the, how the process scheduler works, that it has an active and a passive queue. And then they also do the flip. Actually, the guy that did it, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is that guy that did it. He's um, actually not a computer scientist. He's an anesthetist from Australia. And he wrote the most performance scheduler in Linux. Just another fun fact. And then, um, yeah, there was a bit of a spoiler alert with this thing, because I showed you a bit like how the things get copied. And this is actually co called the copied, copying a garbage collector. We're going to get to this in a, in a minute. So if we look here, you'll ask yourself, what is garbage, right? How does the um, system know that a certain object is not, it's garbage now and can be collected, right? And then if some of you guys did C++ and smart pointers, you'll know that there is something called reference counting. It's a very naive but very simple way of keeping track of garbage. All you have to do is just keep track of how many references you have there, right? So the, this root uh, here, it's actually the global object, right? It's the window object in the browser and it's the global in Node.js. And then from that one, you can actually track the pointers and then you'll know like or references and then you'll know like how many references there are and how they're referenced to each other. And then you keep track of this. And let's say that object get, goes out of scope. Now you remove that reference, so you decrease the counter. Now you know that that's went to zero, so you can just delete it, right? Boom. You got rid of the garbage, right? And then you decrease the other one, of course. And this is what is nice about it is that you have incremental garbage collection, right? The moment it reaches zero, you just take it away. You take that space and put it back into your free list, right? It's very simple. Well, there's an issue here, right? And the issue is that guy goes out of the scope. That gets collected. But now, you just ended up with one, one, and one, right? So oops, that's a memory leak. So reference counting was, works very nice. But if you have a circular reference, it doesn't mat matter how huge it is. It can be just two objects. It can be 10. You cannot collect it, because the, the counter will never reach zero, right? So that's kind of the limitation of it. It's very nice. It's very simple. Internet Explorer 6 and 7 actually used to do this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we all know how good they worked. But there's another way. And that is called mark sweep or mark and sweep. It depends on what the kind of uh, documentation you look at. And that is this object goes out of, let's say, um, scope. And then what it's going to do is going to start from the root, and it's going to go for every single reference, and then it's going to start marking. So it's just going to explore this and then basically put a mark. Like Imagine that this object has like some bit somewhere that you just put it from 0 to 1. And that means that, yes, this is alive. So it's reachable from the root. I need to keep it in memory. And then you just go and go. And then, of course, when you go in the circular one, you already know that the bit is set. So you're like, OK, I'm in the circular one. I'm not going to go in an infinite loop, right? So you're like just stopping. And then let's say that guy goes out, or like, well, he's out. And then you scan, and then you saw that the thing, right, like this one, there was no reference to it. So afterward, after you did all this basically traversing, you just take the heap from one side to another one. And then you just look for objects that haven't been marked. And then you just clear them, right? And yeah, let's take another example with a circular one. So that goes out of scope. Now we're scanning the root. We mark that one, right? And then that's not marked, so we can remove it. That's not marked, we remove it. I kept that thing there to just to illustrate the fact that now this pointer, of course, there's still a pointer there. It actually points to something that was collected. But it doesn't matter anymore because it's not reachable, right? So that goes away, this goes away, and then you're all safe, right? So that's kind of like how this mark and sweep. You can see that is nice. It doesn't leak memory. But the problem is, you saw like in the first cycle, I actually went and I scanned all this circular loop for no reason, right? So the objects were alive. 
and I had to go and do all the traversing. And imagine how, how much traversing you can do. So this mark part can be very, very inefficient in some ways, right? Or it can take a longer time. So a bit of recap. Um, yeah, using free lists, it's fragmentation. Semi-spaces is nice. It actually compacts. You saw by definition it compacts because you're just copying from one side to another one. So it's all good. Yeah, they say don't put words on the slides. People will read them. So I shouldn't have put any. <laughs> um, the problem with semi-spaces is that, yeah, you basically halved the area where you can allocate, right? So let's say you have two gigabytes to allocate memory. Now you have only one gigabyte. And one, after one gigabyte, you need to collect. So that means more often collections. And if you try to make some kind of a game, Oops, maybe that's not ideal for you. Reference counting is nice, but it leaks memory. Mark and sweep, spend some time in just traversing live objects. And that kind of a copy thing that you saw, and then the mark sweep, what usually in traditional or back in the 90s, early 2000s, you actually need to stop the program from executing when you collect memory. Because otherwise, the program will try to allocate more memory, and it's going to start fucking up with your stuff, right? So it's, it's not OK. So you need to stop. It's actually in garbage collection terminology. It's called stop the world. So you need to stop the world, the program, and then collect. And then you resume, and then you collect. And another fun fact, I actually did my master thesis on this to try to calculate how much of the execution of a program in Java, hello, Oracle, um, it spent on um, collecting. And what's nice about Java is that it has different policies. So you can actually tune the garbage collector to use all kind of algorithms. I think there were like eight back then in Java 7, which is nice because then you have on the same VM different implementations. So you, it's very nice field to compare them, right? And then it's about 20% that a program in Java spends in collecting, even though they have this amazing field, um, thing, which is called G4. GC, so generation for garbage collector. And it kind of usually takes advantage of the pagination and things like that to try to almost like hardware accelerated garbage collector. And then that one was a killer. But I could, that one was like, you know, was more my, my reference point. So that one is it's a bit different because it knows how, over a threshold how to do it. So it's very performant because it knows to collect in parallel. We'll get there. So um, yeah, you can do some optimizations. So even using free lists from time to time, you can try to move things around. Maybe it's expensive to do it every time, but from time to time, you can try to do that. I mean, why not use reference counting? It's incremental. You get rid of objects when they are zero. Yes, you do leak some memory, but you can actually measure that maybe, you know, like, and then do a mark sweep from time to time, right? Why not? So that's a nice optimization. And Firefox used to do that at some point. Nowadays, they moved. But like back in the days, they actually used to do that. And maybe you can do this marking in parallel, right? So maybe you can mark things while the program still executes. And then you're going to try to interrupt it only for a very short period. And I'm going to show you in the next slide how you actually do that. And then there's a observation, which is not a so rocket science one, we use lots of temporary objects, right? Everywhere, especially in JavaScript. You do a map, you do a reduce, boom, you've done it, right? Um, why not split the memory and then try to handle these temporary objects in a more efficient way than the long-lived ones, right? So you can split this in something called generations, which is actually the modern way of doing garbage collection. And then we, you can actually combine things, right? Your young generation can be collected using the copy one because it's very efficient. And then the long one that you know anyways, the objects are mostly going to be alive. From time to time, you can just go and do a mark sweep on them. And this copy collector could also be implemented on the fly. So why would you first, you are in these two semi-spaces, right? Why would you stop the execution and just mark and then go and copy when you can maybe, as you mark, copy them, right? And that you can do that using a forwarding pointer. So what you'll do, you'll copy something, but in the old address, you'll say, like, where's the new one? And then when you have a reference, so this way you can keep the references by having this kind of a forwarding pointers. And now I will try to show you. This is going to be a GIF, and it's quite fast, actually. It's from Wikipedia. 
but this is how three color marking works. So basically what you do, you consider a, all the objects white, which means that all of them are prone to be garbage. And then you go from the root set, and then from the root set, the first objects that you meet, you mark them as gray. And then you stop from, you, do, you don't look at the root set anymore. Now you take the heap, and then you go from the gray ones, and then when you reach another object, it's gray, but when you finish all the references of this object, you move it to the black, right? Because you know that it's reachable for sure. And then you go continue doing this, and then at some point, all the black objects are the ones that are alive. And why is this interesting is because you can kind of do it in parallel with the execution of the program. Because you can go from the root set, you mark some things as black, you continue doing all these things, but if something is written, like your object, black object is modified, you just make it gray. And you continue, right? So that's the advantage of it. An object that is black, you know for sure that it's alive. You modify it, it might, it might not be alive. You make it gray, you continue. Yes, maybe sometimes in the next cycle you'll still have an object that was garbage before, but it's not that big of a deal. So in this way, you can actually have kind of parallel or concurrent garbage collector that works concurrently with the mutator, right? Jesus, that's fast. Am I talking too fast? OK. So now we go into the V8 world, right? So as I told you, you can actually split this um, the, the heap in some generations. And basically, the guys at Google, what they do is that they um, split it in something which is called a nursery. That's where you allocate um, objects. In Java, it's called Eden. That's a very nice way of calling it. Um, so basically, what you do, this gets full. You take the live objects, you put them in an intermediate one. So it's one copy. This gets full you promote them into the other one. So it doesn't go back and forth too many times. And I think in Java, you can configure it, actually, how many times you want to do this dance. But in uh, V8, what they do, you allocate here. This gets big. You move them. This gets big, too big. You move them here, right? Because you know like if an object survives one copy and then the second one, it kind of going to stay there for a while, right? And so you obviously use here. Um, Copying collector, right? And then here you use mark and sweep. So the old generation is mark sweep or mark sweep compact. So from time to time you compact it, maybe not all the time. And then in this one you use, in the young generation you use semi spaces that I showed you, like with the two semi spaces. So basically, in the slides I'm also mentioning that before V6.2, um, they were using this um, primitive way of copying that I told you, they, used, they were stopping the world. And then they were like marking and then starting to copy. But then later on, they just combined all these steps, like the mark and the copy and the updating of the pointers. And they bridged this, which is called parallel scavenger, which is like they are doing it on the fly. So basically, it's just an optimization to the algorithm, as I told you before. Um, and then what another interesting thing that uh, Google actually does, they try to preserve 60 frames per second in the browser. So actually, they have um, when the process is idle, they know when you know. Like you, of course, we have all the request animation frames and all that kind of stuff. But they can measure when it's idle and when it's idle, and poof, they go and they, they invoke the garbage collector for a while, and then they stop it. And they invoke it for a while, and then they stop it. They invoke it for a while, and they stop it. Right? And because of this three-color marking, you can do it. Right? You just go like mark, 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 mark. Oh, stop. Right? So it's a very, very efficient way of actually maintaining the 60 frames per second, and that's why. Nothing beats Google Chrome. I'm a Firefox users, user, you saw that when I dragged the tab. But yeah, nothing beats Google Chrome. And I work with Electron, which is Chromium, right? So it's the, the kind of the father of Chrome, or the open source part. And then you can actually visualize all this if you want. There's um, some exposed um, flags that you can um, that are exposed to Node.js. So in Node.js, you can actually create even a program that has a closure that has a memory leak and see how it works. You know, like just, and you can actually make it in real time. This is just a snippet. So you can actually, this is going to be in real time showing you how the memory works. And you can, I don't know if you can see in the back, but in the first 
part, 60% rate was survived. And then later on, it was only 3% that survived and so on. So you can actually play around with this. There's even a Node.js project, which is called, I think, Node.js garbage visualizer. I don't remember, but like just search for it. And you can actually get some nice graphs of how your program works. So if you are doing something, I don't know, like uh, try to do a fancy thing, you can actually take it and see, hey, am I suffering from garbage collection? Because if you want to have some real time thing, right? And then you can actually understand if you're consuming too much memory, maybe you're allocating too many temporary objects. Maybe you should just reuse objects. So you just create a pool of objects. And instead of destroying them, you just modify them. You destroy the properties, but not the objects themselves, right? To avoid um, garbage collection and so on. So you can actually tune in different kind of a ways. So yeah, that's it. That's me. And thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>